Hi, everyone, and welcome to the National Council of Urban Indian Health's second session of this year's Community of Learning series titled Journey to Healthy Communities, uh, COVID-19 Guidelines. My name is Tiffany Stark, and I'm one of the Public Health Program Managers here at NAKUI. Also joining us today is my colleague, Micah Grant-Hunthrop. Uh, she is one of the Public Health Project Coordinators. Micah and I will be your hosts today, and we want to thank you for volunteering your time uh, to participate in today's discussion. We at NAKUI appreciate your willingness to share your personal experiences with vaccines for COVID-19 and beyond. And we do understand that this could be sensitive, uh, especially during a pandemic such as this. But we do wanna reassure you that this is a safe place and feel free to share as much or as little as you feel comfortable sharing. There are no right or wrong answers and we know everyone's at a different place with capacity and vaccine progress. Uh, so this is a chance for all of us to learn from one another. So again, welcome. We're very pleased that you could join. Your answers today are very important and will allow us to further understand your needs around adult vaccinations, specifically around COVID-19 and the flu, and how Nakui could further assist you with any barriers or roadblocks. If you do have any IT difficulty during today's call, please chat directly to comms and events, and Lamar can further assist you. And lastly, if you could, please enter in your name, UIO, or external organization, and any tribal affiliations into the chat box. That way we can get to know each other while also counting your attendance. And before we begin, just to review a few of the uh, quick housekeeping items. Uh, so please, if you have video capability, ensure that your camera is on. This helps to create a more interactive environment. Also, please note that your microphones are muted, but you will have the opportunity to ask questions. You can raise your hand at the bottom if you'd like to be called on or just unmute uh, if the silence is uh, you know, there and pop in. And our chat box will be monitored as well. So please feel free to drop any questions or comments throughout the presentation and we'll address them at the designated time. And also this session will be recorded for educational and quality improvement purposes. And we also invite you to share your feedback with us after the communities of learning through our post-evaluation survey. Your comments are always appreciated and help us improve our technical assistance. And a gift of our gratitude will be shared to those who complete our survey. And a quick acknowledgement. So this content was funded in part by a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services. The contents of this resource do not necessarily represent the policy of CDC or HHS and should not be considered an endorsement by the federal government. And a quick uh, background on NAKUI for any folks that are new. Our organization is a national nonprofit devoted to support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health and public health services for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. We represent 41 of the Title V UIOs under IHS and the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. We strive to improve the health of over 70% of the American Indian Alaska Native population that lives in urban areas supported by quality, accessible health care centers. And so now we'll take a quick look at our agenda. Uh, so we'll move into introductions for our speaker, um, complete a quick little Kahoot activity. Um, Karen Kwok will provide a presentation on COVID-19 guidelines, followed by an open discussion. And so now I'll pass the mic over to Ms. Micah Grant-Hunthrop. Micah? Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We are so excited to have you. So we did want to kick things off with this little Kahoot game. And if you've joined one of our sessions previously, you may have played. But for those who have not, this are, these are the instructions. Um, all you're going to do is on either your a computer or a cell phone, you can go to kahoot.it. And we will shortly share the game pin with you. So um, I think we're ready to switch over to the Kahoot. Thank you. 
All right, so our game plan today is 128-3247. So if you can either use that little QR code and scan it on your phone or go on the website and enter that game pin. You see some people starting to uh, come in our game. We give everyone just a few minutes to get logged in. to note that if even once we get started you can still join i am putting the game pin in the chat i love the honey boo boo name mm -hmm. i guess i'm loving all of these nicknames Nice trip of Santa to join us. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, and then if you're still joining us, feel free to come in partway through. No worries. It's just our first little slide. So coffee or tea? It's just a poll if you'll just click on your phone or on your computer. Most people prefer coffee. Yeah, I'm I'm a both person, but What is your favorite holiday activity? So we have shopping, family time, cooking or cooking slash baking, or all of the above. I have a comment in the chat of, from Johnny eating. That is actually my favorite as well. All right, do you feel that your UIL has stayed up to date with the COVID-19 guidelines? Yes, no, not sure. If you have additional comments, feel free to add them in the chat. So most people said yes, and we have a few who aren't quite sure, and that's okay. That's why we're here is to learn what the guidelines are. They are ever-changing. Have you yourself gotten your COVID vaccine? So yes or no? Everyone has, thank you, yes. That is what we like to hear. Have you gotten any of your boosters? I will be honest, I've not yet gotten my bivalent booster that is on my list. So some people, yes, some people, no, that's cool. And then have you had COVID before? This is the last question. So I have so far made it into this pandemic without getting COVID. Um, I'm not sure how that happened. Um, so yeah, most people have had it, but some have not. So 30% of us, of uh, not had it, so join the club. And that was our little activity today. Thank you so much for participating, and I will pass it back to Tiffany. Thanks so much, Micah. That was really fun. Um, so now we want to introduce our speaker today. So we have Nurse Karen Kwok with us. Um, Karen has. Um, participated with IPC for those folks that um, joined those. So she does look familiar, that's why. Um, but for any folks that are new, so Karen is a subject matter expert on infection control and family nursing with prior consultancies in disaster relief after post-Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. 
and biosecurity with the CDC uh, subcontractor. Um, so everyone, please welcome Nurse Karen Kwok by putting an emoji, your favorite emoji, in the chat. And I pass it now to Karen. Karen? Thank you for your kind introduction, Tiffany, and thank you to the audience in advance for your patience with my internet connection. So I'm calling in by phone. If you have a question or a comment in the chat box that I can't see on the phone, um, just feel free to let um, one of the Nikui staff here know. So um, with the, the presentation today, our objectives are to increase the knowledge of the COVID quarantine guidelines, the COVID isolation guidelines, and COVID boosters and when to get them. Next slide, please. The cold season is here, it's upon us. Because they share many of the same symptoms, it can be hard to differentiate between flu and COVID by symptoms alone. So prompt recognition with confirmatory testing will help guide the treatment. This timely diagnosis is needed due to the timelines for initiation of treatment, whether that be for flu or COVID treatment. Flu treatment should be initiated within 72 hours at the start of symptoms, and COVID treatment should begin within five days of symptoms beginning. And as we all know, um, in um, the Native community at the height of the pandemic, AIAN um, people's uh, individuals were 3.5 times more likely to test positive, 3.2 times more likely to be hospitalized, and 2.2 times more likely to die from COVID. So it's imperative to assess um, first if there's COVID and get treated early. Next slide, please. As of August 2022, the CDC update for isolation guidelines reflects the current science on when and for how long a person is maximally infectious with um, COVID. These recommendations do not supersede state, local, tribal, or territorial laws, rules, or regulations. In contrast to quarantine, Isolation is the separation of people who are not sick from someone who is confirmed or suspected to have COVID. Isolate until your test results confirm you are negative for COVID. However, if symptoms still persist with a high suspicion or a exposure to COVID, then I would recommend repeating your COVID test 48 hours apart. With testing COVID positive, isolate, mask, and avoid contact with people who are at high risk of getting very sick or having complications of COVID. Isolate those five days, even if you are asymptomatic or with symptoms resolving, not having a fever for 24 hours. You wear a mask five additional days for a total of 10 days to minimize risk of infecting others from days six through 10. Next slide, please. During those five days, how do you isolate to limit spreading of COVID? Proper isolation includes staying at home with a mask, ventilation and proper air handling, and minimizing the sharing of bathroom and household items, if possible. During the isolation, monitor for symptoms that might require emergency attention, like shortness of breath, chest pain, or confusion. Next slide, please. When to isolate. The start dates of isolation depends on whether or not there were symptoms. If there are no symptoms, day zero begins on the testing day with the positive result. For days six through 10, continue to mask so that you can minimize the risk of infecting others, particularly those who would be susceptible for complications of the illness of COVID. If you had symptoms with a positive test confirming you have COVID, day zero begins the day of symptom onset, such as having fever, cough, or sore throat. 
stay isolated for five days with continuing to mask to minimize the risk of infecting others from days six through 10. Next slide, please. How do you end isolation? Those end dates are determined by the severity of symptoms and pre-existing immunocompromised conditions. For patients that did not have symptoms or symptoms were mild and or resolving, you must be fever-free for at least 24 hours without use of fever-reducing medications. Symptoms like loss of taste, or smell may still persist for up to several weeks, but other symptoms like a stuffy nose should be improving by that time. For removal of masks, after you have ended isolation, when you are feeling better again, when there has been no fever or not using the fever reducing medications or the symptoms are improving, you would consider wearing your mask through day 10. Again, to protect those who might be at risk for complications, particularly from days six through 10, but day zero through five, you are staying masked because of your infectiousness if you have COVID. Or if you have access to antigen testing, you can consider using them for ending isolation. With two sequential negative tests 48 hours apart, you may remove your mask sooner than day 10. Note, if your antigen test results are positive, you may still be infectious. You should continue wearing a mask and wait at least 48 hours before taking another test. Continue taking antigen tests at least 48 hours apart until you have two sequential negative test results. This may mean you need to continue wearing your mask and testing beyond day 10. After you have ended isolation, if your COVID-19 symptoms recur or worsen, you would have to restart your isolation at day zero and then talk to a healthcare provider with questions about when to end isolation based on this recurrence of symptoms. Next slide, please. Ending isolation if you happen to have moderate or severe illness. The end date of isolation is different for individuals with moderate or severe illness, such as shortness of breath or hospitalization. In these situations, isolation is recommended through day 10. And this is because infectiousness is very likely beyond 10 days, sometimes requiring up to 20 days of isolation. And this is true for people with moderate or severe immunocompromise. Those with conditions of moderate or severe immunocompromise should isolate through at least day 20, use of serial antigen testing and consultation with an infectious disease specialist for their recommendations on when and how to safely end isolation. Next slide, please. For Quarantine, again, as of August 2022, the CDC guidelines for quarantine reflect the current science and the recommendations do not supersede state, local, or tribal territorial laws. With exposure to someone who has a contagious disease like COVID, quarantine is important to limit the spread of um, the illness, in, in this case, COVID, in case you may end up becoming sick after the exposure. So the separation and the restricted movement is recommended such that you can limit the exposure to others if you do end up becoming sick. For all those who are exposed, it is recommended a COVID test by day five from exposure to help confirm if there was an infection due to the exposure. Certainly, if you do develop symptoms, do test even if it's before day five. Next slide, please. How to quarantine. During those five days, 
to limit the spread of COVID, individuals most at risk for developing COVID infection after an exposure would be those who lack vaccination or more than six months have passed since the second dose of their vaccination, or if there are more than two months since their J&J vaccine, or if they had not received any booster whatsoever. Proper quarantine includes limiting activities and movement with mask use. If you are boosted or cannot quarantine for five days, wear a mask for 10 days after exposure is recommended. Next slide, please. The same infection control actions are helpful during this cold season that is already compounding the COVID pandemic, but we will focus specifically on vaccination. I'll touch briefly on the overall infection control actions that are at your fingertips. People can become infected with breathing in respiratory droplets or by touching something such as a surface or object where flu viruses are on it and then later touching their nose or mouth. These same infection control actions are effective with the current re-emerging or new respiratory infections. The ways we block Influenza or COVID are the same, and the recommended PPE, personal protective equipment, has not changed. A respirator is still going to prevent you from breathing in the viruses. And to simplify implementation in areas of higher risk for COVID transmission, consider using universally N95s to protect healthcare personnel. Masking will keep those respiratory droplets out of the air so they can't be breathed in by others. Physical distancing helps people avoid breathing in each other's respiratory droplets. Good ventilation is still important for cleaning the air. Cleaning your hands is still important. And the same is true for cleaning and disinfecting the environment. When a flu pandemic occurs, public health officials may also recommend additional non-pharmaceutical interventions. This includes the social distancing, possibly temporary school dismissals, and um, prevention avoidance of mass gatherings. This is especially important in community settings where people are in close contact with one another. So keep up with what you're doing. You already know your best practices, um, but now we'll focus specifically on vaccinations. Next slide, please. Vaccines reduce risk of the severity of the illness, hospitalization, and death. Immunization programs focus on vaccine-preventable illnesses with recommendations for annual flu shot, as well as staying up to date with COVID boosters. For clinic operations, these programs include updating your policies and procedures for ensuring pre-placement, annual, and other job-related immunizations according to your exposure, depending on what type of patient care you may do, whether that's transport, registration, or patient care in the exam room. These same policies and procedures should also define what are guidelines for exclusion from patient care and the return to patient care for those who've had an exposure or in the middle of an outbreak, whether there may be um, a declination, they decline getting the vaccination or if they happen to be pregnant. While there are other vaccination and tighter recommendations in immunization programs, we're gonna just focus specifically on flu and COVID for the remainder of the presentation. Next slide, please. I will share just some broad overview with a few main highlights with um, referring you, um, particularly if you are a medical assistant or a nurse administering vaccination, the CDC has specific webinars, not just on flu and COVID, but all the various vaccinations that are available. If you are currently infected with COVID, I know that you should 
consider deferring influenza vaccination to prevent COVID exposure to others until there's full recovery, particularly if you have moderate to severe COVID illness and to avoid confusion of any COVID illness symptoms with influenza post-vaccination reactions. And so here um, in this current um, flu season, there are different vaccines um, available, um, whether that be inactivated or live, and all of them are quadrivalent. You'll also have heard just very recently, um, a week ago, that um, now they are allowing for um, the quadrivalent to be available to ages six months and older. Next slide, please. With COVID vaccination, what you should know is that the viruses are constantly changing and therefore we need to stay on top of the most effective vaccination and, and booster formulation for COVID. Therefore, the vaccines for COVID that are available in the United States are always undergoing safety and monitoring such um, as effectiveness for the variants that are currently in circulation. These vaccines are safe in protecting against severity of disease, hospitalization, and death from the currently known circulating variants. The rigorous process that we have used for developing all medications and vaccinations is still in play here for the COVID vaccine development to ensure safety and effectiveness prior to its availability for the general public's use. Each vaccine helps the body recognize and develop immunity against COVID in the event of an exposure and limiting the severity of the infection. The currently available vaccinations are Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson Johnson, and Novavax, um, but none of them are of live virus. They do not enter or alter our cell DNA. And I will cover those different types of vaccines available in more detail in the following slides. Next slide, please. Um, thank you. Uh, the data from South Africa and the United Kingdom demonstrated that vaccine effectiveness against infection from the two doses of mRNA is approximately 35%. And with boosters, it restores the effectiveness up to 75%. This level of effectiveness is dependent upon the variants currently circulating, but a sense of the mechanism of action for these vaccinations, let's discuss further here. With the bivalent boosters that are available from Pfizer and Moderna, they target the original strain of the coronavirus and specifically the BA4 and BA5 subvariants, whereas the Novavax booster targets the original COVID virus. Novavax says that it expects to have an updated shot in 2023, but it says that um, the booster that they currently have can still protect against several strains, including BA5. COVID vaccination still prevents against severe symptoms and hospitalizations, especially if you become infected with COVID. It can take several weeks for the vaccination to produce an immune response. So it can be possible that you get infected before that immunity takes place. So we still recommend masking so that you can protect yourself from becoming sick, especially if there wasn't sufficient time to have effectiveness and protection um, with the vaccine dosing timing. As COVID variants continue to develop, breakthrough infections also 
can occur. So practicing the same infection control actions that we just discussed, like staying up to date with the vaccination boosters, physical distancing, masking, hand hygiene, and cough etiquette still play an important role. The variants of the virus continue to happen much like flu. That's why we have annual flu shots because the mutation of the virus means that we have to keep up with revising the formulation of the vaccination. That's why we had those updates of the boosters and we get boosters periodically. And so um, this helps to explain and to um, encourage us to stay up to date as soon as the boosters are available according to our age and our medical conditions as well. And this is pretty common. For the next slide, um, the primary series, um, we recommend following through with the same vaccine product, whether that be Pfizer or Moderna for completion of the primary series. And we strongly encourage that you receive the boosters for everyone ages five years and older for the available vaccine products, whether that be Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, &J, or Novavax. Now, diving in a little bit um, more in detail for the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna, they trigger an immune response using the mRNA, the messenger RNA um, as a protein to teach the cells to make a protein, even just a piece of the protein that can be triggering our own immune system to recognize the, the virus. This same immune response is what helps us produce the antibodies that help us recognize the virus and protect ourselves if we happen to get exposed to COVID and to prevent us from getting sick with severe symptoms. With the protein subunit vaccine, which is Novavax, it contains pieces of the virus that can cause COVID. These same virus pieces are the spike protein. And the vaccine contains another ingredient called adjuvant that helps the immune system respond to the spike protein should you encounter through an exposure the COVID virus. And once the immune system knows how to respond to this spike protein, the immune system is primed and ready to respond quickly to the actual virus and to protect yourself from COVID. The protein subunit vaccines have been used for years. More than 30 years ago, hepatitis B vaccine um, became the first protein subunit vaccine. Another example of a protein subunit vaccine is whooping cough, um, such as pertussis. It's commonly found in the vaccine formulated Tdap. So um, big T tetanus, um, diphtheria, low lowercase d, and the acellular pertussis or whooping cough. Um, there is research for viral vector technology as well. And for decades, there has been hundreds of scientific studies researching viral vector vaccines and has been published uh, around the world. More recently, we learned about it for um, Ebola and um, that particular outbreak. Next slide, please. So you might have heard different scenarios as to when one is determined to be up to date with their COVID vaccinations. How do you know? Determining if you are up to date with COVID vaccination depends on your age group, the vaccine that was first received, completion of the primary series, length of time since your last dose, and history of a weakened immune system or immunocompromise. Updated bivalent boosters are available as of September 2nd for um, individuals 12 years of age and older, as of October 12th, 2022 for individuals um, that are five to 11 years 
of age and CDC recommends that everyone stays up to date with their COVID vaccines for their age group. And um, that would be true for um, six months to 17 years of age and those that are 18 years of age and older. And we are following um, according to CDC and DCIP and the Food and Drug Administration, um, their recommendations for um, Novavax. Next slide, please. Um, if there was a recent COVID infection, do you still need another COVID vaccination? If you become ill with COVID vaccination, oh, I'm sorry, with COVID infection, getting a COVID vaccine does give you added protection against COVID in the future. However, you would reconsider the timing in which you receive that COVID vaccine dose. You may consider delaying that next vaccine dose for three months after the COVID infection, taking into account um, if you have a risk for complications due to a weakened immune system or diabetes, or there may be a risk of disease due to your close contacts should they be exposed to COVID. Next slide, please. These are resource links for vaccination schedules according to your age group or special considerations for weakened immune systems. And these same resource links will be made available after the presentation. Next slide, please. For COVID vaccine outreach, I invite all of our UIOs in the audience here to share in the chat box and definitely when we come to our conclusion, I want to hear from you all the successes and lessons learned from starting your own vaccine outreach and programs. But I wanted to highlight specifically the successes nationwide in the community as they embrace, supported, and encouraged the cultural preferences integrated into their vaccine distribution programs. Specifically, there's examples here are the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, who prioritize elders, as well as native language speakers for receiving their vaccine initial doses. The Chickasaw Nation, Cherokee Nation, and Lumi Nation are role modeling their gains with outreach to non-native community members because of their program successes. And the Alaska Tribal Health Organizations had unique partnerships with pilots and pharmacists such that um, they could transport these needed doses to where last mile health, the geographically isolated communities within Alaska. Next slide, please. Native community members communicated with um, vaccination as being a good relative in their community, that it was a responsibility for protecting their community and ensuring concerns about vaccine safety were addressed with fluent Native speakers and healthcare professionals as trusted sources of information. Next slide, please. Since COVID vaccines have become available across the country, it's become clear that in many places where people need it the most, including non-English speakers, essential workers, and communities of color, including Native communities, that they were dying at disproportionate rates, just not being able to access them. And whether it is navigating online signups, needing a car, or just being able to take time off work, these are barriers of the system itself. And the successes that I just highlighted in the Native American community certainly are things to 
replicate and to shout out for not just helping and supporting others in this learning community, but again, being role models to other communities of color as allies as well. The health system challenges with historical barriers to healthcare include funding challenges and governance for clinic services available in Indian country. And the institutional challenges that some of our UIOs have brought up throughout the three years of the pandemic have been um, trying to institute and revamp their employee health immunization program with policies and procedures to ensure that employees and patients are safe. What are the exclusions from patient care if they have not yet received their boosters or if they happen to be pregnant? With this same vaccination program, there are considerations not just for clinic operations with transport or food distribution, but for actual patient care as well regarding vaccine storage or injection safety too. Next slide, please. Um, that is now the conclusion of our content here. And I know that I covered many, many detailed policies, procedures that can go into your program. And so I welcome not just your questions or any clarification on the content that was covered, but I certainly want there to be successes and lessons learned to be shared here as well. And so I give the floor back to our moderators here, as well as to the UIOs in the audience. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you so much, Karen, for your presentation. A lot of great information in there. Um, so like Karen had mentioned, we want to open the floor up to our UIOs uh, to see if there's any questions for the presentation or anything else that you may have thought of um, during the presentation. And I do recognize some names in the audience. And I know that um, they have had a lot of lessons learned and had been shared regarding the start of their vaccination program. And so um, if I may call in the audience, I see um, a couple of individuals like, um, Johnny Delgado, I think Lucas Sparkman, and possibly Molly Siegel and Liz Bess and Renee Tennyson are from UIOs. And I wonder in this community of learning what might have been new information that you might have heard here that you might be implementing your immunization program. Or what were successes, lessons learned just from this initial startup or the bivalent vaccine outreach that you did? Go ahead and come off mute or go ahead and share in the chat box, please. Hello, everyone. This is Johnny Sagrado from Bakersfield American Indian Health Project. Sorry, I'm... Uh driving and some of the audio did cut out during some of the presentation, unfortunately, but a couple of uh, key things that I picked up on was the 10 day quarantine for moderate or severe. Um, I didn't realize it was a 10 day. I know of the five day, but not the 10 day though. Um, I also didn't know that the bivalent, uh, I believe you said it was authorized for, I think you said six months and up, um, opposed to it being, um, was it five and up before, uh, five years of age and older. Um, so that was new information for me, though. Um, but the rest of it was, um, was was knowledge that I knew already. However, um, it would be nice if you guys had uh, some of those resources. I know there was several links that were shared. If there is stuff we can print up to share and pass out. We actually have an event coming up, and that was uh, specific. That type of information was specifically requested. 
uh, to share with the community that we're going to be um, serving at this event. Thank you for sharing, um, Johnny, and you're totally right. Things are changing all the time. Um, when my patients would call in and ask me about the policy, I always double check every single day because things are changing for the recommendations and you, you as well as everyone in the audience is doing the exact right thing in coming to these webinars, sharing information amongst each other as to what is the newest and how does that affect how I shape the immunization program, but policies and procedures to protect your staff. So that's great. Anybody else in the audience? Sorry, I got one more thing to add. Um, what I think is one of the most important things is for uh, to reaffirm that, uh, not to reaffirm, but to basically push out there that these restrictions are still in place. Um, lately at my at my UIO, I've had a lot of staff uh, Know, speak out more about the like the masking guidelines uh, and mandates. Uh, so the state of California has a still masking in healthcare settings, and it's been a lot of. Well, the president said COVID is ended. Why do we have to wear these stupid masks? Uh, and, and so I think that this basically just reaffirms what the expectation is by the CDC, regardless of whatever political power, or whatever political means may be in place. That this is still the recommendation, regardless of our personal feelings, and it's what's what best. It's what's best for the for everyone. In a sense. Thank you for sharing that as well, where certainly you're three, we're fatigued, but you all already know the same infection control actions that help protect us, not just ourselves from um, becoming exposed, but our close contacts as well, especially if they are at high risk for becoming um, sick with severe symptoms and or hospitalization and death. Um, and being a good relative is about protecting others as healthcare workers too. But also it does tell you too that we are not just advocates for our community, we are also role models that by using our masks ourselves, that that is showing how we intend to care for not just ourselves, but one another. And so um, I continue to mask all this time through um, and even in my travels. So thank you for bringing up that important point. Others in the audience, please feel free to chime in. So one, so one question that I've always had is, uh, what, what information should be shared if the patient is in quarantine and what, how is that different than if the patient is in isolation? Thank you for that question. Um, so with the differentiation between quarantine and isolation, Quarantine is that there was an exposure to an illness, in this case, COVID. Whereas with isolation, it's if you are already sick, especially if you have been confirmed to test positive for COVID. And so um, those terminologies, um, they are separate and distinct and guide what is your timing for the isolation and the measures that need to be taken to protect those who could get infected by being exposed to you if you were positive for COVID and needing to isolate. And so that's how you would differentiate between the, the two, where quarantine is an exposure, you are not sick, you don't have any symptoms. Isolation, however, is if you 
do have those symptoms, you were confirmed positive for the COVID, I would still say, especially if the first test was negative and you still have symptoms, you were definitely exposed to COVID, the due diligence would be to stay masked and to repeat the COVID testing at 48 hours apart because the vaccinations are so effective that actually that low viral load that might have been the false negative, it might turn positive by the second serial test 48 hours apart. So still mask if you're symptomatic and test again at 48 hours to really confirm that you're not COVID positive, you're not exposing um, others to getting sick and possibly dying from COVID. Thank, Thank you, you for that answer. answer. And while we wait for the audience to share um, their successes or questions, I want to just distill down from the content here. Yes, it's very detailed. Yes, there's these different algorithms, um, but center back on the prevention that you know for infection control actions. And then also, if um, in that vaccination prevention protection, some of the criteria to consider, for example, for COVID vaccination would be age, vaccine you were first received, completion of the primary series, length of time since your last dose, and whether there was a history of moderate or severe immunocompromise, or if you had a recent COVID infection. So those are the, the scenarios that will come up. But remember, at the conclusion of this um, session, you will get those specific links um, by which you can refer to. And that's the ongoing learning that has been true throughout the pandemic. The current science continually updates as it should. And the new recommendations that come out in our community of learning, we support one another on making sure that we are most up to date with what we're practicing in um, the clinics and with our programs. And we, and we do have, have a question, question from, from the chat. Will, will the COVID-19 COVID vaccine be considered as routine as the influenza vaccine? Thank you, Molly, for um, being courageous and um, sharing that question. Good question. That has been something that we have wondered at the very beginning, and it's seemingly going to be going in that direction. Again, where similar to uh, the flu vaccine, we just have to stay current with what are the most common circulating variants at that time, and we're staying Staying in step with protecting our patients or community members with a vaccine that is continually being studied for safety as well as effectiveness based on what's currently circulating in the community for variants. So great question, Molly. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. And thank you, Karen, for your presentation and also all of the valuable information that you gave. Um, so we do want to proceed with the presentation. Uh, so next slide, please. So we do have a couple of slides with the references for the presentation. Um, and like Karen had mentioned, we will package uh, this um, PowerPoint and any additional resources for you and send those uh, via email. Next slide, please. And then we do want to touch base on some upcoming NACUI events. 
But you can see there's quite a few. Um, we do have um, our next um, health information technology technical assistance support uh, tomorrow. And then we also have um, vaccine equities um, third and final COL on January 11th. And then we have a couple other events too throughout January. So definitely stay tuned for those. Next slide, please. And then we do have current funding opportunities available. So the electronic case reporting or ECR uh, UIO subgrant award year two, that is still open. Um, applications are on a rolling basis. And we are awarding up to three UIOs um, for 84,600 each. And then we also have emergency preparedness and vaccination planning storyteller application. Um, so that's another funding opportunity up to 30,000 each um, and applications are um, open through the end of December. And just to note, we will be hanging around following the close of this session for any additional questions or support. Um, but in the meantime, we do invite you to share your feedback with us. Um, and as a gift uh, for our gratitude, we'll be um, sharing um, a gift of gratitude, sorry, uh, for those who complete the survey. So just keep that in mind. And again, just thank you all so much for your time. We at Nakui appreciate you volunteering your time, um, but also your thoughts, opinions, and suggestions. So thank you so much, and I hope you have a great re rest of your week and a happy holiday. Um, and we will be hanging around for any additional questions.